Hello, I'm Tony Gaida, and this is my New York. Gay Talese is here today to talk about one of the most famous pieces of magazine journalism ever written, his profile of Frank Sinatra called Frank Sinatra Has a Cold. Esquire magazine published it in 1966. The piece has been studied and celebrated ever since. Now, in the centennial of Sinatra's birth, it has been republished as a handsome and expensive coffee table book. Gay, are you surprised that 50 years on, we are talking about and, and celebrating a magazine piece you really didn't even want to write? No, it, uh, it was an assignment that I had to deliver because the editor wanted it. <clears throat> and the reason I didn't want to do it you must understand that I'm, I'm 83 now, but when this piece was assigned to me in 1965, uh, there had been, all my life there had been pieces on Sinatra. I grew up as an Italian-American boy in the south of New Jersey, a town near Atlantic City called Ocean City, and then I was born in 1932. In the 1940s, Sinatra was on the radio, he was the biggest sensation among teenagers, you know mm -hmm. what I'm And I grew up with Sinatra. I grew up with the publicity of Sinatra. I grew up knowing remotely a lot about Sinatra from what I heard, from what I read, what I, newspapers, magazines, books even at that stage. So when I, at age 33, I think I was, I would, I just left the New York Times where I'd worked for about 10 years as a general assignment reporter and sports reporter as well earlier. I didn't, I didn't think that I could find in Sinatra anything that hadn't already been published because when you're a super celebrity, when you're Mick Jagger or, or, or Lady Gaga or Madonna or someone who's had a long history in public life and have been interviewed incessantly, constantly, they develop, these super celebrities develop, I do suspect, a kind of of, of, of language that is fashioned to any anticipated question. So you're getting a kind of elongated soundbite at most, getting nothing of candor or honesty hardly at all. I've heard you say that so, what interests you the most is candor, not quotes. And, and not interviews so much. Well, it's a pleasure to be interviewed by you and to do this show. Uh, I myself do not like direct uh, dialogue, Q&A, Q&A. I do not like that. What I do like, if I can get away with it, is to hang out with people. The art of hanging out. Yeah, and I've done many of my pieces that are remembered in some of them in anthologies that college students have access to are where I am moving through the life of people at a certain time, sometimes a crisis moment or sometimes just an ordinary moment in their lives, maybe for a stretch of a day or two or three. And and I watch how they interact with people that are connected to them, maybe through their work, or people that don't know about them but are responding to them because they're well known, or maybe they're notorious, whatever it is. It is really inspired. Tony, I have not been inspired by journalists, though I am a journalist and a prideful one. But what inspired me was short stories. I grew up as a tailor's son, and my wife, uh, my, 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 Mother ran a dress shop. My wife is a working woman, a book publisher, so I've always had workers in my family, my wife and my parents, both all the time. There's no, not, not much home life, not much cooking. There's always going to a restaurant after the store was closed, Atlantic City or somewhere near Atlantic City. And I, I didn't have much of a literary background, but I did read magazines, the Saturday Evening Post, magazines that are bankrupt and gone and forgotten now, like the Post or the Colliers or or, and later I started reading The New Yorker. And that's really why I discovered short stories, either paperback anthologies or magazines such as The New Yorker. Writers that might not be so famous now. John O'Hara, I don't think people know who John O'Hara is. Uh, 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 Irwin Shaw wrote the, 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 the Girls in Their Summer Dresses, The 80 Yard Run, and, uh, Carson McCullers, these are the people who wrote short stories, which were works of the imagination, including F. Scott Fitzgerald, the stories of Hemingway, Tolstoy, etc. 
They're all works of the imagination, based perhaps on real life, just like Arthur Miller writes a play called Death of a Salesman. It's, it's a Willie Loman character, an imagined character, but might have been part of Arthur Miller's uncle or father. We don't know. But I am a journalist. I'm not a man of the imagination. I don't want to make anything up, but I do want to fashion my life as a storyteller would. I want to tell stories, real stories, real names, verifiable facts. And so I took the story form, the short story writer's form, because I adored that kind of writing, and, and, and inserted it into the magazine form. Because after all, a short story can be 1,500 words or 15,000 words. And, and an and a article such as the Frank Sinatra piece you have is 14,000 words. You can do if you have time and if you can hang out with people. And that's what that. this is. This you is hung it. out for six no, weeks. I hung out not because... And uh, because Sinatra wouldn't talk to you. That's right. They wouldn't. But uh, you started to say, I didn't want to do them anyway. But I was, I was dead on a one-year contract with Esquire. I had, as I said, nine, ten years as a journalist for the, Daily, for the New York Times. And I wanted to write at greater length and take more time. Esquire is a monthly, so you have more time than a daily. I was always chasing deadlines and always being cut to size and space. I never had enough room. So you could I never had, get 14,000 words in the Times. N not no. that you couldn't. But um, I had to do six pieces. So I said, if I take three pieces, you take, the editor takes three pieces. So I did the first piece I wanted was on this crazy guy I knew at the Times who was an obituary writer. His name was Alden Whitman. It was my idea because I was fascinated by him. He bas he's something like the Melville character, uh, Mr. Bartleby, some mm. scrivener, some crazy little clerk. And you called and this, him Mr. Bad News. And this is Mr. Bad News. Yeah. This Alden Whitman, a bizarre, eccentric guy that waited for people to die so he could write about. That's one piece. Second piece, I said, listen, I want to write about this great uh, uh, managing editor we have over there at the Times. He's married to, Clifton, to, married to Margaret Truman's daughter named Clifton. Uh, Clifton Daniel, uh, and Harold Hayes was the editor, big boss, big name in those days. He and George Lois created. Lois is the guy who put those great covers. This is the 60s we're talking about. Right. And Hayes was the premier editor of the 60s. Esquire was at its height then. Even my little New Yorker was not so, in those days, at its very best in the 60s. And Hayes, Mr. Hayes, Harold Hayes said, no, we can do Sinatra. Oh, come on, Harold, you don't want to do Sinatra. Everybody's done it. Life, Life Magazine had a piece two months before, and Look has got another scheduled piece. No, no, we, it's easy. We have a cover. You don't have a cover. This is a cover for you. Easy. Go out there. The press agent, Jim Mahoney is by his name, will see you. We stay at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. You can have some fun out there, better weather, and Sinatra will see you Monday. You fly out Saturday or Sunday or whatever and see you Monday. And after you finish that piece, it should be easy. Then come back and you do Clifton Daniel, the New York Times guy you want to read. I said, okay. And I, of course, flew out, fully expected it would be easy, set up, cover story. And this press agent is going to be leading me to the great man himself. And I tell you, I'm not going to sound un uh, without a certain uh, expectation. I had never seen Sinatra. I had grown up with Sinatra. I could almost memorize some of the great songs word for word. Mm. I've never seen him. So I was looking forward to that. But I didn't see him because the Monday when I called the press agent, this whole change of story, what happened was Sinatra has a cold, said the press agent. So I said, okay, so a couple days later, he'll get over the cold and we'll do this piece. Well, and not so fast, the press agent said, this was over the phone. I'm calling him from the hotel Beverly Wilshire, as I said before. Frank has second thoughts about this. Why? Well, this Walter Cronkite in CBS we hear is delving into Frank's alleged connection to organized crime figures. I said, Jim, the Jim Mahoney. I said, Jim, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do Frank Sinatra, Man and His Music. NBC's has this big spectacular coming out called Frank Sinatra, Man and His Music. And about two, I'm going to talk about his music and what his life is like and, you know, hang around with him a little bit. So I thought. Jim said, I'm, uh, Mahoney said, I'm afraid the lawyer here believes that we want to see the piece. Oh, come on, Jim, you can't do it. I couldn't do it at the New York Times. I can't do it at Esquire. I can't do it anywhere. You can't do that. No. That's it. Well, then maybe you should go back to New York. I thought, wow, not so bad yeah, idea. Good idea. Well, yeah, I'm ready to go. I, oh, right. I said, well, listen, I have to call the editor about this. But you want, you're saying I have to submit this? Yes, we would like it for accuracy. I said, I'll be accurate. No, but we want to be sure you don't put in things that we don't want you to put in. I said, well, I'll call the editor and tell him what you said. I called the editor and said, 
Harold, we can't, of course we can't do this. So do you, what Think can I- Think of final approval of, yeah, of your story. you can't do it. I said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I can, I can come home, or if you want, I'll go to a cheaper hotel. I'll hang around. I can talk to a lot of other people that know Sinatra, because he's not going to talk to me anyway. And I'll, see, and I'll let's see what happens. I'll spend a week. You don't have to move to better, uh, less less expensive hotel. Said they wouldn't say this today, but here in 1966, <laughs> just stay stay at the four five star Beverly Wilshire, keep your rented car, uh, take people to lunch and dinner. So I started taking people, not renowned personalities, but people on the margin of a superstar's life, such as musicians that maybe played in orchestras that where Sinatra was a solo singer at one time or another, like the uh, Tommy Dorsey band or the right. Harry James. This is all world, post-World War II period stuff you're hearing, of course. And maybe actresses that were in movies, Sinatra made a lot of movies, and, or dancers or people who used to date or people, it was his tailor, for example, long, not across far from the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, was a tailor shop called, called Dick Carroll's. Dick Carroll made suits for Sinatra. I walked to one day and Sinatra said, I mean, Dick Carroll said, Oh, we make, on average, we're always making two, two tuxedos for Frank Sinatra, automatically. Always. Always making two, because he, he's about 100 tuxedos, but you, you always have to have extra tuxedos on the road with this man. I met another woman who said, oh, he wears toupees. You know that? I said, yes. She says, well, I carry 60 toupees around in a little satchel. She we carries what? 60 toupees of Frank Sinatra. 60. 660. In a, in, a, in a satchel on the road with him. I said, this really? is her job. That's her job. And she told me, Maggie, in those days, I'm making $500 a week or something like that. This is, doesn't sound like much now. But in those days, it's a pretty good job for doing the little like How did you meet her? How did you find I her? I met her through one of the persons I knew in, in um, Beverly Hills was a restaurant owner. The restaurant was called The Daisy. The Daisy. It's, very it's the, famous. First, the first scene of the, yeah. of the story is in The Daisy. And that guy, Jack Hansen, was the owner. And I had known him from a previous trip, and he was very friendly, and his wife was very friendly. And, and this guy, Jack Hansen, said, you know, Frank has, wears toupees. I said, well, I heard that. He really does. In fact, he said there's a woman that does nothing but carry his toupees around. Really? And I, I said, I how would I reach her? He said, well, you know, I, I think I know somebody who knows her. And so we, that's how I met her. This is the hanging out that you, yeah. I think... I don't want to say you're famous for, but in, but in, but you the first book you ever wrote was Serendipitous uh, the Journey. Serendipitous Journey, which scenes. is observing from the margins, observing stuff that's not noticed by others. And here you are in Los Angeles, working from the margins and winding up with a marvelous well, profile. Was, but that's not of a so, star. It's not so far from the way I was born and reared. I was born in the margins. Which is to say, when you're of an immigrant background, and I'm old enough to know that in the 1940s, I told you I was born in 32, so 10 years after, I'm 10 years old, the war is on. Hmm. And I'm a boy in a Protestant community, Ocean City, was founded by Methodist ministers. My Italian-born father and my Italian-American Italian mother are running a store on the main street of a Protestant town. It's World War II. My father's two brothers are the Italian army fighting the Americans, invading from North Africa across the Mediterranean into, into southern Italy called Calabria. That's the toe of the boot. So I'm not at 10 years of age the feeling I'm like I'm George Plimpton. It's my land. It isn't my land. I'm an interloper. I'm a, like a Muslim today, like some Arab kid must feel in Brooklyn somewhere. And also, when you are the son of a storekeeper, or a daughter of a storekeeper. You, when you grow, grow up in a store, you learn a lot of things that are great for journalism. One, be, be, be careful and kind to your customer. No, be good to your sources. I mean, treat people with respect. After all, they're customers. They keep us alive. They pay for what, you, what we need. And we say support us. Secondly, I learn from the customers, all kinds of people wandering in and out, that something about the marginal characters of the town, meaning, my mother ran a dress shop, I told you. Who were the people who were customers? Women. Who were the women she catered to? Overweight, middle-aged women who had deep pockets. The wives of the mayor, the wives of the Cadillac dealer, the wives of the superintendent of schools. The women who had white gloves in the, in the, in the winter and summer, who, who didn't go to the beach because they were middle-aged and a little overweight, 
but they were the money people, the, the social strength of the town, the, the gossips. And they would gossip in Mother's shop, and I'm hearing these stories. They weren't so racy. It wasn't exactly uh, the, the, the erotic uh, afternoon, but they were telling you of little things about the war. The nylons were hard to get. The gas rationing was on. Their son was in Sicily. Their daughter was in a defense plant or working as a nurse, ran off with a serviceman, eloped, all this kind of stuff that goes on in the exigencies of a time of war. And I'm an eavesdropping kid, 10 years, 11 years old, behind the counter, listening, listening, and watching the passage of time and the, and the, Turks, the town rotating in and out of a shop and how they look, what they dress, how... My father would be measuring men for suits on his knee with a little little marker, a little chalk marker. They would be talking in the fitting room, men who were the, the editor of the newspaper, the mayor of the town. So I'm getting from, from the voices, the uh, eavesdropping, uh, voyeurism. I'm hearing and, and making, impre my impressions are formed by the characters like a parade mooning. So journalism, I was a, as a kid comfortable with strangers very much curious about, because I, I was an outsider. When you're an outsider, you're not so blasé about anything. You're already wondering, how am I different from them? What are they like? I don't want to get away from the subject of our interview, but the point is, my background, even though I didn't go to a great journalism school, and didn't even go to a journalism school, uh, I, I was prepared for the world, the life of journalism, because I was inbred with curiosity I was an outsider, and great journalists should be outsiders. They should not be part of power. I'm afraid today, we don't want to get on this subject of journalism, but today the problem with journalism, to agree, is journalists are so damn well educated, they are the same kind of people socially and economically than the people in power. They swim in the same pools, they, they go to the same prep schools, they, yeah. their wives have the same cocktail parties. That's why we miss it. That's why we miss mass, weapons of mass destruction, and it's why we got into that Iraq war. But that is another program with you. Let's get back to well, what come I back and do that. This come, yeah, this is a story of an immigrant Italian, like the Jews and the Irish and the blacks that I grew up with. We were the minority, and really were minority. Today, in this time of so-called democracy and egalitarianism, political correctness, nobody's supposed to be. Everybody's supposed to be the same and loved. It's not true, and, and you know. But still, we have this presumption of uh, egalitarianism. But in those days, there was no fooling around. You really were called kike and Jew and Dago and Wap. This was not uncommon, and no one got, got a rap on the knuckles for doing it. It wasn't that you had any feeling uh, that this was wrong. It was rampant and common. I don't want to go too far in this either, but I'm merely saying I grew up sensitive. And so when you have the sensitivity and you know other people have perhaps similar situations and you're writing and reporting upon them, you're a little bit more uh, uh, sensitive to their situation. Uh, that's all I'm trying to say. Back to Sinatra. This is a long way from Sinatra. But even Sinatra was an immigrant. Or like me. Well, I, you know that's what a I good mean? point. So I, I, had mean... identity. I could identify. He was a little older than me. But his father was... A Sicilian worked in the, as a fireman. His, the, the Sinatra's mother got the job of, uh, for, for the husband right. as a fireman. This Sinatra's mother was like Catherine de' Medici, a tough woman. Granted, Dolly. Help. She was Dolly. Yeah. She was a fierce, and Sinatra was an only child. Frank Sinatra was a little bit of a spoiled kid, you know. But he also had some feelings of being a minority. And I know that in his life, anybody called Sinatra Dago. Or he was like my father, he'd throw a, throw, a, throw a knife at him. I mean, there was really, this guy wasn't all that secure. Jumping ahead, when John Kennedy was president, and Robert Kennedy was the attorney general, and they brought up this little mafia stuff because they didn't want the president of the United States spend, spending time in Frank Sinatra's house after the first election of John, after the election of John Kennedy. Sinatra, Sinatra was really amazingly angry about this. Not so amazing, he was, he was furious because they were putting Sinatra back into the mafia, and that's the very thing that Italians like me, or Italian Americans like me, grew up hating, because the people in the newspaper, when I was growing up, my father was reading the war news in the world, in New York Times, but only the mafia, 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 Al Capone, or then it's Lucchese and all that, or, or the Mussolini, the fascists. I mean, all the Italian news in the 40s, post-World War II, was bad, except for one thing, one thing, the singer. The singer from Hoboken, 
gradually, sensitive as he was, moved up from being an ethnic idol, which he was to people like me, to being a man in the mainstream, from coast to coast celebrated, first for his singing, then for his acting as well as singing and his dancing in movies with Gene Kelly, getting the girl, not playing mafia people in the movie, playing cops and army uh, soldiers, or like from here to eternity, patriot. But at the same time, when I got there that day, now we're getting to where we're here, supposed to be here, Cronkite says, uh, the, the press agent said, we think Cronkite is going into alleged criminal association with Sinatra and the mafia people. This is what's set him off, it had a hold. And I also could identify with that. So at first I thought, well, I can't do it. I can't show the piece, but I know how he feels. I started seeing these people. I know that we forgot about this question we asked, what sounds like an hour ago, but I started seeing the marginal people who are my people. The tailor, Dick Carroll down the street. This could have been my father. I saw the, the tailor shop, it reminded me of my father. He was a little better than my father's because there were richer clients that he had, of course, this guy, Dick Terrell, uh, Carroll. But he told me things, and the woman with the hair, with the, well, I never met a, a woman carry toupees around, but I certainly met people who had sort of odd jobs, like, like, like the, the, the people in my father's tailor shop who would, have, would press the suits back there. You know, I, the, the minority workers, blacks, were always the pressers in this tailor shop. I, got, I was comfortable. So I was comfortable with Sinatra's people, this, the, the, the marginal people, the trumpet players, the, the dressers, the girlfriends, the former the guy that rented cars for Sinatra's troupe. And I interviewed them. And I'm writing them. I'm writing and writing about them. And then about a couple of weeks later, I'm, doing, I'm getting a kind of, it's like a mosaic. It's like a, a, a shape that's formed by many different impressions and shadows and prismatic positions of a superstar. Frank Sinatra, this iconic character rising out of the, into the celestial wonderment. And all these people are kind of little spear carrier, kind of people car talking about it. Frank this, Frank that, Frank this. And I'm writing it down and it's taking on the shape. After I was doing this for a couple of weeks, the press agent calls, oh, you're still in the Beverly Wilshire? Yep. Uh, I understand you're talking to some friends of Frank. Oh, I don't know. What are you doing? I'm just trying to work. How's Frank's, how's Frank's cold? Well, he's a little better. Uh, how long are you going to stay here? I don't know. Look, he said, you still can't talk to Frank because Rudin, the guy named M Mickey Mr. Rudin, yeah. he was the guy. He won't put up with it. He won't, you can't do it. But I'll tell you what I will do. He said, this is Jim Mahoney. Tomorrow, we're Frank's voice is, we're going to go to Burbank. We're going to go to Warner Brothers Studio. He's going to try to begin this NBC special. It's called, as I said, Frank Sinatra, Man is Music. Dwight Hemian was a big director then. He'd done a special with Barbra Streisand. He was a big name in those days, the mid-'66 we're talking about. So the press agent comes in. He's my minder. He introduced, he, he, he had a nice big brown Mercedes station wagon outside the uh, a, a, a hotel, and the doorman sees me get into this, and I'm now being driven to Burbank in the, in the driver, passenger side in this Mercedes, driven by James Mahoney, hotshot press agent of Frank Sinatra. We go to the Burbank. He never lets me out of his sight, Mahoney does, but I was able to see, I saw the Nelson Riddle's orchestra warming up, and I saw many Budweiser salesmen lined up, pretty girls from every, from the whole building rare to, you know, about 200 people, and there was the Sinatra had a, I didn't realize it at first, there's, there's a guy that looked like Sinatra on, on stage while they were doing the lighting, fixing. A double. A double. And I said, who's that guy? Looks like, that's, that's not Frank, is it? No, that's his double, Mahoney said. What's his name? Johnny Delgado. I said, yeah, you know, Johnny, the, I'm told, he tried to be, get a job in, from here to eternity. And the job that, that Sinatra got, the, that a little private, whatever the hell it's called, uh, Maggio. Was it called Maggio? Maggio. He won the and, Academy and, But Johnny Award. Delgado wanted that part. You no, know, but we'll give you Sinatra's, you could be the double. And that's how this guy started his career, on from here to eternity. So his whole life, like, like the woman carrying the, the toupees, is, in, is, in, is kind of like being a, a surf in the, in the realm of the Sinatra castle. I get the sense, Gay, that you feel that this is a better profile than it would have been had Sinatra talked to you. 
It would have been. Um, it would have been, even if he would talk to me. You wrote a book called Thy Neighbor's Wife about sexual mores and sexual practices in the United States and, and participated uh, roundly in them and put a lot of pressure on your yeah. career and your marriage. And now you're writing a book about your marriage. Mm -hmm. How much trepidation in writing that? Well, probably not as much as you'd think because quickly, I've been married 57 years. During that marriage, we've gone through a lot of stress, of course, but survived it. So you become stronger the longer you last in a marriage. I always felt that I'm married, but I'm also an observer. That sounds ridiculous. A voyeur, maybe a voyeur. I think journalists are voyeurs, more or less. My first line in the book about the New York Times was, journalists are voyeurs who see the warts on the world, the imperfections in people and places. That's the first sentence. So I am a kind of a voyeur as well as a husband. I am an observer as well as one who thinks he is observing. Um, I have a sense of detachment. Fitzgerald said writers have that. They, they're there, they have a sense of being there. I also, though, must tell you that from the time I got married, which was in 1959, even before that, I was keeping and saving everything about my marriage. Every little note, every phone message, every hardware sales slip. That w I save things. I don't only save things. I have Catalog in my office. Catalog. I catalog, but I have files in it. They're in order, chronological order. So I've sort of, I've sort of been married at the same time, an observer of the marriage. Well, and I can't wait for this book to come out <laughs> um, <laughs> because for, for one reason, I, I maybe I'm a warrior and I want to read about yeah. your life, but. More importantly, because it'll give us a chance to sit down again and talk. Well, it's delightful, well, Gabe, thank you to, for to having be, me uh, um, to spend time with you, and I look forward to more. I appreciate being here. Thank you again. Be sure to join us next week when we showcase a parade of gangsters, comedians, entrepreneurs, artists, and oddballs as we examine the history of the Catskills and how it changed America.